Okay, homeschoolers, you're going to want to take notes on this episode and share it with all your married friends. Today, one of my favorite Catholic experts, Mary Ellen Barrett, is going to surprise you with some incredibly easy ways to make your husband very happy. Because when your marriage has that sparkle, everything else in your homeschooling life gets a big lift. Stay with us. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell to join our channel. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create a homeschool you love for the people you love. I'm your host, Lisa Maladnik. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking with my good friend, Mary Ellen Barrett. I'm so happy to have you back, Mary Ellen. I want to tell people a few things about you before we dive into a fantastic topic today. Uh, Mary Ellen Barrett is a mother of eight children and wife to David. She is a lifelong New Yorker and an active member of her parish of Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Lindenhurst, New York. Mary Ellen Barrett is a columnist for the Long Island Catholic. She's an editor for Seton Magazine, or the editor, I should say, and chronicles the journey of living a faithful but imperfect Catholic family life on her weblog, Tales from the Bonnie Blue House. Mary Ellen has had her work published all over the place in Faith and Family Magazine, CatholicMom.com, Catholic News Service, Catholic Digest, and was formerly a frequent contributor to CatholicExchange.com. Mary Ellen has guest blogged on Faith and Family Live, CatholicVote.org, and Catholic Cuisine. She has blogged about the occult and the New Age at AmazingCatechists.com. She's been a guest on Relevant Radio, Radio Maria, several podcasts, and EWTN's Sunday Night Live. Currently, Mrs. Barrett is a marketing consultant and magazine editor for Seton Home Study School. Mary Ellen speaks and writes on issues pertaining to homeschooling, Catholic family life, marriage, bereavement, and special needs issues. Welcome, Mary Ellen. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I love talking to you. It's always fun when we can catch up. <laughs> I know. I love it. It's like, I wish we could uh, clink coffee mugs through the screen here. <laughs> We're in a little Zoom session, uh, but and cheers to you. I've actually got some. Cheers, yes. I have mine too. <laughs> Homeschooling mothers can't fuel without it, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Now, Mary Ellen, I'm just wondering if maybe some of our listeners, just a teeny bit might have their hackles up. When the topic is keeping your husband happy, and you speak at many homeschool conferences around the country, what is the first reaction that you get when you introduce the topic? It's funny. The first reaction is um, the husbands pack my room. <laughs> <laughs> I usually get, um, you know, a fair sprinkling of men in the room, but mostly my topics tend to be toward the homeschooling mother, practical mm -hmm. advice thing. But I, I have really had standing room only and more than 50% men because they, they take their wives to the talk. <laughs> oh, look at this. I want to see what she says. And it's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> feminists don't care for the talk. But I, you know, I don't care. <laughs> I am not a feminist. In the, in the modern sense of the world, I am right. not a feminist. And right. I believe that God created us both for in different images and likenesses of him for different reasons. And we complement each other perfectly. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing wrong with um, a call to serve your husband and, and to create an environment where he feels loved and honored all the time. So I, I think it's a good thing. It really is. And I, and I always find it very funny. Once a year, we hear St. Paul's letter, I believe it's to the Ephesians, where he says, women submit to your husbands or wives submit to your husbands. And I once uh, was reading through Mulieris Dignitatum, John Paul II's 1988 document, and he broke that open. And he did set aside some cultural issues saying, you know, we have to read this in context of St. Paul and his time. But this really is a call to submission, but it's mutual submission out of reverence for Christ, the Christ in each of us. But, and yet, that submission and that reverence for the presence of Christ in each other, as you said, it's a complementary kind of a situation. We don't submit in the same way to each other, and we don't have the same roles. No, and I once had a priest explain it to me that um, when, when our job as wives is to submit to our husband's um, 
God-given authority in our house, as heads of our, of our household spiritually, their, our job is to submit. Their job is to get their family to heaven. Now, I think it is way easier to submit than to get this crowd to heaven. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it both involve a, a real calling to humble service and extraordinary mm-hmm. love. So however you view this role of submissive wife, submissive husband, what God is really calling us to is to serve each other and to put each other first, mm-hmm. which is difficult. You know, it really is difficult, but it's it when you do it, with a real humble heart, not that like I'm um, slamming around, do it, which I did this morning, <laughs> by the way. I, I had a little pissy fit <laughs> of something. So, you know, imperfect. But um, when we're called to do something with great love like that, um, mm-hmm. the whole tenor of your household changes. It really does. Mm-hmm. I feel like too, whenever we step into humility, like God knows better than I do. His ways are better and higher. Isaiah 55, right? Um, we also step into mystery, which is where a place of great power, where society is telling us one thing. There's this cacophony. Again, we've talked about this before, Mary Ellen, of programming and proselytizing us that our only way to be happy is through the satisfaction of ourselves. When joy and peace occur in acts of service, that liberation of being fully alive, the glory of God Uh, glory of man is, no, the glory of God is man fully alive, right? And that's us serving and loving. I also love, I saw something on Shalom World Television. There's a series called Real Men. And Deacon Harold Burke Sivers talked about the part in Genesis where uh, God creates a helpmate for Adam. And he says, this helpmate, the words used in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew are Ezer Konegdo. And he says, what those words mean, there's been a lot of controversy around translating them because it doesn't mean what you think it means. It means helpmate. But the image from those ancient times was of a co-warrior, someone who stands by your side, who has your back, who fights evil with you, who protects you, who looks out for your best interests. So was Eve just a soccer mom and someone who did Adam's laundry? No. She might have done all those things out of love for him and love for her family very definitely and poured her feminine genius into doing them well and offering them to God. But what we're talking about here are two partners in this battle, as you said, to get the family to heaven and how do they complement and complete each other according to God's plan. So there's a lot of mystery involved here and it can be hard for our modern sensibilities, right? Yeah, it can be. It's, it's, we're so indoctrinated. Have you, it's a very bumper sticker kind of thing, but you see it all the time that um, people say when they get married, we're going to divide everything 50-50. We're going to do all the chores. We're going to do all this 50-50. And it's, you don't even think about it. You think, oh yeah, that seems very fair. You know, that seems like a fair thing to do. Um, except that you both should be giving a hundred percent of everything mm-hmm. you have all the time, every day, you know, and I'm not talking about he cleans the dishes when you cook or something like that. Those are acts of service. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a nice thing to do, but this whole like balance sheet in your marriage is mm-hmm. just a recipe for failure. Amen. You know, you lists and you're ticking off boxes. He did this, so I do this. And he didn't do this, so I'm not going to do this. Mm-hmm. You're going to fail. You are going to be miserable. Right. Um, when you can say honestly, I gave as much as I could. I gave constantly. That's when you're going to have peace and success and freedom in your marriage. Mm, so many of the saints who were the most joyful people who have ever lived have said you should fall into bed at night exhausted <laughs> from true. loving. Mother Teresa said love should hurt. Yeah. How yeah. about that for a countercultural message? Yeah. So what are some things that we can do in our marriages and in our homeschools? Well, how are we, what are we about here today, Mary Ellen? Step us into your idea about this, because I think well, you have fantastic ideas. Oh, thank you. Um, I think that there is no one way to be a perfect wife, but mm. there are a billion ways to be a really good wife, okay? Mm. There, is, there, is, um, a, there was probably only one perfect wife. The Blessed Mother, I'm certain, was perfect. Everybody else is not. But there are so <laughs> many ways that you can be a, perf- a perfectly good wife for your husband. Mm. Um, and this, these, these things that, that I, uh, we're going to discuss, I found work very well in my marriage. You should take them and make them work in your marriage and take what, you know, everybody's marriage and family are different. Um, my first thing is, and it sounds so passive, but to pray for him. Mm. to pray for him all the time and not that prayer like god please make him stop being an idiot or god <laughs> make him stop being so stubborn and we've all prayed those <laughs> prayers <laughs> it's not the best oh yeah <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what you have to pray for is um 
it, you can certainly pray for significant change, but what I've found and what I found out in confession, um, I, I remember once I went and said, I, I had this whole laundry list. I was confessing my sins, but really I was telling the priest everything that was wrong with my husband, mm-hmm. <laughs> which he said, you know what, this, the problem isn't him, it's you. Oh. You have to pray. And I was like, well, I was incensed. What do you mean? It's me. <laughs> Clearly I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> But what it is, I had to pray and I prayed all the time. And what prayer does, it transforms you, the person who is praying. Mm. So does, does it change him? Yes, eventually, but mostly in response to the change within me. Mm. You know, so I'm not trying to change him. I'm not calling on God to say, this person you made and chose for me is wrong. <laughs> it's all wrong and you have to change it. I am saying that I need help in dealing with whatever this situation is. Please transform my heart. And when you really ardently and, and humbly pray like that and your rosary and your prayer book and whatever it is that works for you, and you go to the blessed sacrament and you go to confession as often as you can, it is transformative. It mm-hmm. like the whole tenor of your family changes when you have that peace that God is on your side. He's working through you. Things are not going to change overnight. Um, and, and we're talking about kind of bigger things like issues in your mouth. I'm not talking about dropping the socks on the floor and stuff mm-hmm. like that, but, but the things that really challenge you as a married couple. So, and it sounds so passive, like I need to do something. I need him to do something. The prayer, it's, it's not an overnight fix, but pray all the time. Ask God to give him wisdom. Ask God to give him courage and maturity and and spiritual maturity and success and, and pray for his good day at work and all those things. Um, and I feel like well, we can enlist our guardian angel too. We can, oh, yeah. we can have our guardian angels open up pathways of communication between us, protect us from temptations when we're apart and all of that. There's just so much supernaturally that we can do to love each other. Right, right. And, and those, someday you're going to get to heaven and say, oh, all those prayers have worked toward your, your eternal salvation, both yours and his, and that of your children. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no better example for your children than praying spouses and loving selflessly like that. So keep that in mind, too. When you're, when you're setting up yourself for a really good marriage through prayer, you're setting up your children to have the same kind of spirituality in their own relationships and to, to want that for themselves. So that's also, it, it just trickles on now. You know, mm, I would think that must to- dramatically impact the culture of your home when your heart is in a place of prayer, humble prayer, again, on behalf of your husband. I remember there's a very funny story about Padre Pio. A woman came to him in confession, and I don't know if it was her husband, I suspect it was, or maybe a neighbor, but she spent her confession, I think it was her husband, running him down and telling Padre Pio all of his sins. And he said, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, now I'm going to give you the penance for your husband's sins, and you're responsible for for doing it since you confessed his sins. <laughs> and, and and just like, that's such a wake-up call. Like, Good what one. are you doing? <laughs> and I feel like when we focus on somebody else, it's like the old take the log out of your own eye thing. Yeah. We're focused on someone else's sins. The devil has to be laughing hysterically because we're not paying attention to our own spiritual growth. Right. God is trying to make a masterpiece in our souls. How can we attend to that conversation with him and grow and remediate our own faults? Right. Unless we attend to them, and and you can't if you're distracted by somebody else's. Yeah, and and like you said, the devil loves that kind of thing because it it creates dissension. Because once you're so focused on what he's doing wrong or his faults or his little character flaws, that you, that it it makes you miserable, mm-hmm. and in turn you're making him miserable, and now the kids are miserable, and everybody's miserable, and the devil loves the miserable family. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. Right. So prayer, prayer is off, pray as often as you can and, pr- and pr- pray and ask God to reveal his strengths to you, mm. to show you exactly where he's so strong and why he's so perfect for you. And he will, it will happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's something that happens over time, that we start to see each other's gifts and the way God has designed our marriage. That reveals itself over time. We, we do this thing where we give our vows and we're all dressed up and it's very exciting and romantic. And then real life sets in and we start to see each other's faults and weaknesses in a new way. It mm-hmm. really comes into high def. And we can feel disappointed and betrayed at that point and feel like now that gives us the right to run them down, to be corrective and to not be on their side anymore as if they've betrayed us when in fact they've done something sacred they've entrusted themselves to us yep exactly exactly Hmm. okay so what else what can we do proactively to that sets a tone that strengthens our husbands well i found um being his cheerleader Hmm. um 
really telling him what you appreciate about him and when. Um, it really helps, again, to just create this atmosphere of gratitude for him in your home. Mm-hmm. We just recently had um, a situation, my daughter Kelly, at this very time last year, I think it was this past this week last year, had emergency gallbladder surgery. Oh my goodness. And, yeah. And it was all very stressful, but thank God she was fine. But it turns out that the hospital we went to, it was an emergency. So it was through the emergency room and then you're taken up into surgery a few hours later. The hospital was in network. The surgeon wasn't. Oh. So of course, you know, and we had no choice in the surgeon. It was ridiculous. But so of course the, um, the insurance company denied the whole thing and they were sending, the doctor was sending us bills for $25,000. Oh my gosh. It was, it was crazy. My husband has spent the last year battling with the insurance. It had to go to court. It was nonsense. Oh and it turns out that, you know, it wasn't our fault and, and the insurance company paid the bill to the surgeon. Wow. He spent the last year doing that. And so he texted me just a few weeks ago and said, oh, that's all settled. You know, it's off our credit report. It's all done. And I just said, thank you so much for doing that and taking care of it. I had absolutely nothing to do with any of it. I, I didn't see a form. I didn't take a call, nothing. And But he has spent a year doing this. And I was so grateful, like, oh, you know, that's not hanging over our heads. I had nothing to do with it. Mm. So I told him, thank you. Just thank you for doing that. It would have been easy to say, okay, you know, on to the next thing. Thank you for taking care of all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, He, and and just not criticizing, you know, so he doesn't need to know everything I think. Like my mother always (laughs) used to say a little mystery is a good thing. (laughs) He doesn't need to know that I think that this particular thing was wrong thing to do or this mm. and criticism just, just brings everybody down. Mm. So instead of doing that, find the positive thing and just appreciate that. Thank you for working so hard. Thank you for mowing the lawn. Thank you for picking up the pizza. You know, mm. my husband has this very nice little habit. Um, he's, he's not a particularly effusive person or, or, you know, he's, there's no flowery speeches or anything like that. But every time I cook him a meal, even if it's not even a good one, thank you for this. He wow. thanks me at the end of the meal. And I just think that's so sweet. Mm. Um, so I try to do him, thank him for those little things. He, he makes the coffee in the morning. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I, things like that, just all these little thank yous add up to this atmosphere of gratitude for him and his gifts and the hard work that he does for our family. So mm-hmm. be his cheerleader and tell him to like, when something's going on at work, okay, you can fix this. Don't worry about it. Or, you know, we'll pray you through this, or you've got this, all of those little sayings and, and phrases, just, he, he knows you have his back. He mm-hmm. knows that whatever is going on out there in the world and the world can be cruddy. He's mm-hmm. got somewhere to come home, a soft place to land where everybody's going to appreciate him for the good mm-hmm. guy that he is. Yeah, exactly. Um, I read a study years ago that said that, um, and they're tightly ranked women and men with the first and second priorities about what they want from uh, their spouse. The top two were respect and love. And for men, respect edged out love by a little bit. And for women, love edged out respect a little bit. It's not that women don't want respect or men don't want love, but men truly need to be respected. They yeah. were, they, when asked, they said they'd rather live without love than respect. And so we see how we can really demoralize a man. What about when there's company in the house and he does something wrong? Oh, you just, you just kind of smooth that over. You <laughs> ignore it. You talk over it, whatever it is, and you address it another time. You never criticize your husband in front of anybody else. You mm. don't criticize him to other people. You don't complain about him to other people. And this, I see this as a huge problem. It, it got to a point where I would stop hanging out in the dance recital, you know, the dance waiting room where the moms hung out mm. or the soccer field. I would just go sit in my car, read a book, pray my rosary because people, uh, women, it's a terrible mm-hmm. thing, but they're very petty about things. And they like, they almost brag about how dopey their husbands are mm. or the idiotic thing he did or this fight that they had. They tell you all the deep gory details. I don't want to know any of that. It's none of my business. And it's such a mere occasion of sin to get it, fall into this in gossiping mm-hmm. or knowing things about people I don't want to know. So there's the temptation to repeat it. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's just demoralizing, like you said, and terrible. If you were having a problem with your husband, you wait till a private, quiet, calm moment and you talk to your husband. Mm-hmm. And if it's, a, if it's an issue where you can't solve it, then you go to a good Catholic counselor or you go to your priest or do you go to somebody who can quietly and confidentially counsel you through this. You mm-hmm. do not call your mother or your sister or your best friend 
and complain about them because that violates the sanctity of your marriage, I think. Mm -hmm. And it also puts them in the position now of wanting to take your side Mm -hmm. and kind of hating him for hurting your feelings or, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So then you may get over it at some point, but they never will because you were hurt, you know, and it's hard for them to see him clearly. You always want to present him in the best light. Mm. And even if he screws up and insults you in front of somebody or makes a dopey remark or something, and everybody everybody speaks out of turn once in a while, just laugh it off and pretend it didn't happen and you don't come right back at him. Um, a dignified response is always the best way to go, I think. Mm, absolutely. And, and I've also noticed, too, that when I've seen people correct each other in a group, I always feel bad for the person being corrected. Even if they were wrong, it doesn't make me feel better about the wife or the mm-hmm. husband who chose to criticize in front of us all and make us incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah, it's one of those moments. Everybody gets embarrassed and uncomfortable and it just, yeah, no. It's one of those when you say, all right, well, we got to go now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's time to go home. <laughs> yeah, and, and I remember being shocked when I first started doing exactly what you were describing, hanging out with the nursery school moms and hearing that it was practically like a sport mm-hmm. to outdo each other with embarrassing, humiliating stories about their husbands. And I thought, oh my gosh, it was just tragic. I felt so bad for them. As if husband's job is to pay for all your shopping and be the butt of your jokes. Yeah, I know. It's just, it, it's a cultural thing. And you see it more and more and more lately. And I just, I, I think it's such a shame. And I think you can't have a good marriage um, when you talk badly about your husband to anybody who will listen. I just think, then how are you speaking to, directly to him? Mm. Or if you're being really nice to his face and then and talking badly about him, that's like a mean girls thing to do. And we, we don't let our teenagers do that. So why would you do that to your husband? Yeah. You know, my mother said something that I thought was really cool when I was a teenager and it never left me. She said, I, my parents always had an amazing like cinematic kiss at the door when my dad would come home. Oh. And I, yeah, like, it, I don't mean it was gross or anything. It was really sweet and really romantic. And, um, and my dad for many years was a military officer. So he'd walk in in his, you know, beautiful uniform and she'd have primped before he ran, came in the door and she'd be all fluttery. And I once asked her, mom, do you guys always feel like that? Like, what's going on there? You know, you, you guys are in love every single day. And she said, you want to know a secret? I don't always feel that way. Sometimes I really feel it fading. You know, life just intrudes. I get this kind of eh feeling about the whole thing. And she goes, so I start acting like I feel that way, which then gets that sparkle back in his eye. And as soon as I see it in his eye, man, it becomes real for me too. So she said, you know, I act as if, and then it all just comes back. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that in, in all facets of my life. And I've found it to be helpful, I, especially like when I work on trying to be pleasant because I'm not always I'm a little snarky <laughs> and a little cranky. But if I slap a smile on my face mm. and I'm happy, eventually your mood lightens, like you feel better, mm. you know? And it's, it's um, what was it? It was called like Pascal's Challenge or something like that, where somebody was challenged to live with faith for a year. Live as if you had faith. Pretend you have faith. And at the end of the year, let's see what happens. And the person converted Wow! because it just, faith took over, you know? So I think pleasantness or, or gratitude or all of these things, if you just even have to pretend, and sometimes you do, because we don't love everyone and not everybody's lovable every moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you just pretend for a little while, it catches up and your mood lightens. It's, it's really the way we're wired, especially as women. We want to be happy. We crave loving feelings. So if you just put yourself in a position to love, it's just going to happen. It, it just is. It's weird, but it does. <laughs> and I feel like God blesses our efforts too. There's, there are graces that come flooding in as soon as we make a selfless, loving choice. Um, isn't it true to Mary Ellen, that the way um, we are taught to view our husbands through media, you know, he's always the dumbest guy in the room. Every television oh, wow. commercial shows the children and the mother smirking while daddy doesn't know the best place to buy and get a bargain or whatever it is. Yeah. And so um, we can feel like it's our job to make, the, make sure our homeschool is perfect and that we're the experts. What what happens when we take it all on ourselves? Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's particularly true of homeschooling mothers, I've found in, in the consulting that I do. Um, 
And, and one of the things I, I tell people is you have to keep him involved in your daily life. Keep your husband involved because as moms and homeschool, and when we're the primary homeschooling parent, it's very easy to say, okay, I'm going to pick this curriculum. I'm getting all these books. I'm writing out stuff. I'm doing all this. And then somebody will ask the husband, well, you homeschool, what do you use? Like do you, what curriculum, how do, what do they do in math? And, and the poor guy's like, I don't know. You know, she takes mm-hmm. care of all that. Mm-hmm. And it's, he should know because he has men have very specific um, v- views of their hu- their children of their family and that's why again this complementary thing works is because they have a perspective that we don't have mm-hmm. so it's important to discuss with him your curriculum and what you're doing and what your plans are and how this one's doing in this subject and how this one and what the the plan is for this one and who's struggling and who's zooming through the the science or whatever and and these are the field trips we're thinking about and he needs to know what's going on in your day make him the principal you know so that discipline problems are brought to his attention right away and i've had to do that we have all this technology um and i've had to like get my husband on the skype and plop that laptop in front of the laptop right in front of whoever happens to be annoying me at the moment and he he addresses he's very good about addressing concerns as soon as possible mm-hmm. um if he's if he's like on board with that kind of stuff and he knows what's going on, you will have no bigger cheerleader and no bigger backup in your homeschool. Mm. You no, know, but if he has no idea what's going on and you he comes home one day and you say this child's impossible. It's been six weeks since I could do math with him, and well, what is he supposed to do then? Like, so it has to be a kind of catch up. Not not necessarily every day. Did you have a good day at homeschool? Yeah, everything went well, or no, it didn't. Or, but it's it's good to have those parent teacher meetings. You know, with your husband, the principal teacher meetings. Mm-hmm. Go out to lunch every so often, or out to dinner, or go for a walk, and just catch him up on the day. Catch him up on mm-hmm. what's going on. Keep him involved. Ask his help in prioritizing. If you're having a bad week or a bad couple of weeks and there's a million things going on, a lot of people have the, you know, when you're in the Little League tournament or the dance competition season or in our house, the Shakespeare season, um, what do you need to get done? What, what do you think I should be doing here? What should be the priority? And sometimes it's one of these, all right, do you want dinner or do you want clean underwear? <laughs> <laughs> We usually have pizza on those nights. <laughs> Which, help me prioritize what needs to be done here. What's going to help us function best? Um, he's not a mind reader. So keep him involved in your everyday life. It's it, because it, it recognizes his gifts with regard to your family and your children. I hate this, like you saying, this cultural idea that all men are stupid. Mm. And women are these screaming shrews who, who run the house and they do everything so perfectly. And, and men kind of just, you know, lopes along like some kind of, you know, troglodyte just following mm. around doing what he's told. I hate that perception. Mm-hmm. And Men get a bad rap these days and they are so strong and so knowledgeable and have such great perspective. We only have to let it loose. You know, we only have to let them be men. And it's amazing the power a wife has. A wife can utterly demoralize a husband with a word, a look, a tone of voice. It's amazing how fragile. It's almost a house of cards. I remember reading one of those, you know, women are from Venus and men are from Mars kind of conversations. And basically it was that men can quickly go to a place of despair. Yeah. when their spouse is critical of them. So we have to really be incredibly gentle and recognize our power and use it for good. Be like superheroes that have this incredible power. So what are you going to do? What is God going to say to you when you get to the pearly gates? Did you love him? Did yeah. you show him that he is pr- a precious, beloved son of the father, is, that he is a precious husband and father, that he's someone who can have his own sort of relationship with his children without being constantly policed and corrected? Yeah. Would you want to see some woman speak to your son the way you speak to your husband? Ooh. Because that's the example that you're setting. You know, you want your son to grow up and have a wonderful marriage with a girl who loves him and adores him and just thinks he's everything in the world. That's what you want for your son. So you should treat your husband like that. So that's what your son learns. Same things with dad. And everything I'm saying applies to to men too. They can all do this for their wives. But um, it's the same thing. Like your children are learning these foundational relationships from you. How you speak is how they're going to learn to speak to their spouse if marriage is what they're called to. So we always have to remember that. Like, what do you want your, your son to say to his wife? And what do you want your wife, that wife to say to your son someday? Mm-hmm. 
Right, exactly. Because the tendency is to seek out a similar family culture. Yeah. Um, uh, let's close out with some quick ways to express our love. What are some specific things that really any of us can do, or we can pick and choose the ones that really jump out at us. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help those things jump out at us. Which ones will work really well in our homes? I have a list. You know me, I'm a list maker. <laughs> I, so I have it. this quick list of things that just little, little things you can do in life that just show him that you love him. So should I read the list? Like, yeah, absolutely. I'm All trying right. to hear the list. Quick ways to show love. And my husband helped me with this list, by the way. I love it. This is I where I pack the room with the men. They love these lists. <laughs> um, greet him at the door when he comes home at night or in the morning or whatever, he, whenever he works, greet him at the door, welcome him into his home, mm. you know, make sure that he knows that you missed him. Everybody missed him. The kids, daddy's home, welcome him at the door. It's such a nice thing to do. Yeah. Um, when he's getting ready to leave in the morning, put his coffee or his tea or whatever beverage out for him, put it in the go mug, get it all ready, get it set up for him. Just one little chore he doesn't have to do. Mm. Men love back rubs and foot rubs and ladies, you go to heaven when you give him a foot rub because their feet are nasty. <laughs> Such a straight shot to heaven, ladies. It's a good thing. They love it. Mm. Um, get the car oil changed. You know, that's mm. just one of those chores we always leave to the men. And it's it's an hour in the in the gas station. And they, they just get so excited when you do stuff like that. <laughs> like your mom, primp a little bit before he gets home. You know, comb your hair. If you're a lip gloss makeup person, maybe put on a clean t-shirt, you know, um, just so he knows that you're freshened up and, and he has this, oh, look at my beautiful wife moment when he walks in the door. Yes. Um, while he's in the shower in the wintertime, if you throw the towel in the dryer for five minutes and warm it up and, you know, deliver it to him in there, they love that. Wow. Yeah, that's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> that's got like a five-star suggestion. <laughs> the man will walk through fire for you. If you do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, wear something you know he likes to see you in, you know, whether it's a dress or your cute pair of jeans or high heels or whatever, you know, dress up for him a little bit. That's a nice thing to do. Feminists will tell you not to do it. It's just a nice thing to do. Mm. Keep his favorite cocktail or beverage on hand. My husband loves craft beer. He also loves bourbon. So I always make sure we have something in the house when he feels uh, like relaxing or if it's a soda or whatever it is. Keep something on hand that he enjoys so he, he never has to run out and get it. My husband's an organized paperwork guy, he's an accountant, so I pre-sort the mail for him and, you know, put it in piles. He loves that. Mm. Um, be nice to his mother. <laughs> Not always the easiest thing in the world to do, you know, but, you know, make sure he reminds, you know, remind him to call and things like that. Mm. Ask him what he likes for dinner and then actually cook it, you know, oh. ask him his favorite meals and cook it for him. Mm -hmm. When he walks in the door after you've welcomed him, give him 15 minutes to just decompress. He did have a hard day too. And you might be desperate to get those kids off your hands or to hand him a baby or whatever. Just give him the 15 minutes, take a quick shower, change his clothes, you know, freshen up, whatever it is he needs to do. And then, then give him all the kids and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> On a weekend day, once in a while, bring him coffee or breakfast in bed. Mm. Um, and then the, the one thing, the one guaranteed to get him home on time is to text him something a little racy during the day. <laughs> it's, it's, nobody stays late at the office on those days. <laughs> oh, I love that. I think that's the, one of those things that can really get lost in the shuffle. And if we haven't done it for a while, you might feel a little shy about doing it. Like, yeah. oh, what's he going to think if I do this? Is he going to even get it? Is he going to understand? What do, what do you say to, to those of us who might be a little shy? Oh, don't be shy. He's going to love it. The men, men men's, um, are wired for physical affection. You know, that part of marriage is so important. It really is. And it's and women are much more wired for the emotional affection. We respond so much better to the, the compliments and the flowers and the lovey-dovey stuff. And men, just the touching and the feeling and, and the marital act is just so important to them. And I, I tell, and this is another reason why the room gets packed with men, is that um, we... <laughs> It's so important not to neglect that aspect of your relationship, the hand holding and the and the physical part of it, because you know, we're tired all the time and I understand that. I spent 17 years without a decent night's sleep. Mm. I understand being tired, but we do everything when we're tired. Mm. So like mopping the floor when you're tired is a lot less pleasurable than other things when you're tired because if it's going well, you forget about being tired after a while. But <laughs> you know, after you mop the floor, you're still tired. So. <laughs> 
Amen. Hang on and, and, and just show your love in ways that make him feel loved. And those little racy texts, just send it. You know, just make sure you're sending it just to him and not like on a group or something. You know, <laughs> double check that. <laughs> Not the whole family or your mother. Right. Yeah, yeah. No family group text there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Those are fabulous. I love just the little gestures, meeting at the door, the coffee mug. My husband's been saying to me for years, you made my coffee in the same tone of voice. And we laugh when he says it because it's like a running joke, but I can see in his eyes that it makes him happy yeah. every single time. And if I have to leave really early, because you and I travel for speaking and things like that, before I go, I make sure I do something for him. I make sure that his drawers are full of clean things for the week or whatever it is, and I'm not going to be there to do. And the stuff's in the fridge, like you said. Yeah. He should know when he looks around the house, every little thing where he looks, I don't mean every little thing, you get the picture, yeah. what you can do to let him know you were thinking of him before you went to be with others. Yes, yes, it is. It's so important. It's that, that appreciation and that's showing that you're caring for him all the time and that he's at the forefront of your mind. Because our priority should be God, your husband, and then your children. Mm. And if you keep that order in your life, you're going to have a very happy homeschool. Mm -hmm. And the pull is very strong to our children. I mean, we carry their DNA in our lives for the rest of our lives, and they carry ours. So there's something very biologically hardwired there for us to default to the children. Yeah. But, but the happiest marriages do exactly what you described. husband right below God. Yeah. It's, it's important to put him as a priority. And it's very hard to remember when you're that physicality of taking care of small children, mm. getting pulled in different directions, and there's somebody constantly on you and, it, and you're tired. But finding the time and these little gestures that take almost no time at all, mm. um, just keep that alive, that, that love and that priority alive. And that is so, so, so important for the health of your marriage and the health of your family. Mm. And what does that do to the homeschool? Well, of course, it just makes everything easier. It really does. You're backing each other up constantly. You've got each other's backs. You are each other's best cheerleader. The children are seeing a great marriage, a prayerful marriage, a loving marriage all the time. They know they can't get through one to one of you to the other one. You know, they can't picture <laughs> each other. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it's peaceful. You know, it, it results in peace. Not every day, not all the time. We're all fallible human beings. But all in all, you're going to have a peaceful, united home front. And that's a good thing for your homeschool. And look at the tough messages we're trying to teach our children about belief in God and virtue and self-control and all of these things that the, our society is pushing back against, tearing to bits. If they don't see it lived out in the home, they're not going to believe it. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. What a rich episode. I feel like we could have gone on another hour uh, very, very easily. This is such a great topic, Marianne. Thank you for being with us today. Um, just such a joy to talk to someone who has the sense to put self aside and to really be for someone, to be for your husband. And just to see the happiness of you and your family has been a blessing to Thanks. me and mine. Thank you. You'll have to have Dave on and see what he says. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Note to self. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking uh, time with us, everybody, today. And stay tuned for our special three-minute feature. God bless. Hi, I'm AJ Catapan. Welcome to Books and Blessings, a place where I get to share with you some of my favorite books for Catholic teens and tweens. Today, I'd like to introduce you to The Ten Commandments for Kissing Gloria Jean, a middle grade novel by Britt Lee and published by Pauline Books. The Ten Commandments for Kissing Gloria Jean is a story about a girl facing a dilemma we don't hear much about, but does affect a number of Catholics. What does someone with celiac disease do when it comes to receiving communion? In the story, we meet eighth grader Gloria Jean. When the book opens, Gloria Jean is on her first movie date with a boy. Although she swears to her mom, it's really just boys and girls hanging out as friends, since her two female friends are also bringing guy friends. Secretly, Gloria Jean is hoping she might get her first kiss at the end of the date. But partway through the movie, she needs to run to the bathroom, when she experiences what she refers to as the troubles with a capital T. 
Eventually, Gloria Jean learns that what has been sending her to the bathroom is actually celiac disease. She can't have any gluten, and when she does, it wrecks havoc with her digestive system and makes her feel absolutely terrible. This also means she can't receive a communion host, which makes participating in her confirmation retreat and even regular Sunday Mass a matter of utter social awkwardness for this eighth grade girl. Every young teen and preteen wants to fit in, and Gloria Jean stands out like a sore thumb when she can only receive from the chalice. To further complicate life for Gloria Jean, she's discovering that the messages she's getting in her sex ed classes at her public middle school are conflicting with what she's hearing in her confirmation classes when it comes to chastity. If you heard my Books and Blessings segment last month, you might recall that I talked about Rightfully Ours, a young adult novel by Carolyn Asfalk with a strong theology of the body message that is aimed at older teens. If that book sounded a bit too mature for your teen, but you're still looking for a way to start conversations about chastity, then the Ten Commandments for Kissing Gloria Jean might be a better place to start. With an eighth grade main character, it still has a strong theology of the body message, but at a level more appropriate for a young teen or preteen. The Ten Commandments for Kissing Gloria Jean by Britt Lee has been awarded the Catholic Writers Guild Seal of Approval and is appropriate for grades six and up. To see more book suggestions, visit my website at ajcatapan.com. There you can also learn about my own books for young readers, including my YA novel, Angelhood, and my middle grade novel, Seven Riddles to Nowhere. Thanks for joining me on Books and Blessings. Be sure to find me online on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or on my website, ajcatapan.com. Until next time, happy reading. And that's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com. Be sure to subscribe to Homeschooling Saints and leave us an honest review. God bless you and thank you for joining us.